We're talking about how to make the most of your life in 2024. We've been kind of bouncing around the book of Joshua and God is encouraging us to dream again. I wanna tell you a powerful story today about breaking down barriers. This young nine-year-old boy who wanted to be an NFL player, he drew a picture of himself at nine. Wasn't that great of a picture, but at the bottom, he put this phrase, best safety in the NFL. All right, parents, you know how unlikely that is, right? And uh, so he just kind of held on to that dream, but there was a reality check in Bo's life. And that is when he signed up for high school football, he weighed in at a whopping 100 pounds and measured at five foot. And that's it, just five foot. He measured at five foot. <laughs> and the coach said, you have no business on this field or on this team. He went, home, he went home, told his dad, dad, they measured me. They said, I'm, I'm not big enough. He said, well, did they measure your heart? And then his dad decided to tell him a story about ranch dogs because he grew up as a, an aide on a ranch. He says, Bo, let me tell you a story about the, uh, a rancher's best friend is his dog that helps him get, do all the herding. But the way he chooses that dog is when there's a, a litter of puppies, he looks for the runt. He looks for the smallest dog and ties a piece of yarn around his neck. About 12 weeks go by and they kind of grow up and he goes, he takes that litter and he sells all the other dogs and he keeps the runt of the litter. He says he does that because he knows that that runt had to fight for every square inch. He had to fight for food, he had to fight for water, he had to wrestle bigger brothers and sisters. And he says, so he picked that dog because that dog is tough. That dog can handle a difficult time. Well, Bo took that picture of that rancher dog and he says, that's me. I'm small, but I'm an overcomer. And so he just really worked hard in every aspect of his life. He held on to that picture. He held on to that dream. And in 1984, however unlikely it is, Bo Eason was in the NFL draft, he was the first safety chosen in the NFL draft of 1984. Today, I wanna to talk to you about breaking down barriers in your life. In Joshua chapter six, we're gonna look at a famous story um, on, called the Battle of Jericho, right? And here's how it starts. Joshua chapter six, verse one, the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid nobody was going out, nobody was coming in. How are we gonna get them walls down? We're gonna pull three principles out of this story that I gotta tell you, in the 945, I just felt like people were hearing these things and it was just going off, igniting on the inside of them. One guy told me after service, man, I brought my friend because I thought, man, they really need a word today. He goes, it was me. And so I want you to pray. I'm gonna pray. I believe God's gonna speak to some people here in this service today. Can we do it together? Lord, we know you are so awesome. You are so great. Worship was so great today. We love lifting up the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. I pray today that you open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears. God, we're so desperate. We need you. Give us vision for our lives. Let your word transform us today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, I don't know what your walls would be like Jericho. I don't know what your strongholds would be in your life. Maybe for you, it's fear and worry and anxiety that just kind of grips you. Maybe there's an opportunity on the other side of that fear, but you just can't get past it. It could be an addiction that you've just dealt with over and over and just can't break. Maybe it's just a sense of despair or loneliness. Maybe it's kind of an emotional wounds and you feel like, man, emotionally I'm not healthy and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling getting there. Maybe it's regret, maybe it's intimidation. I don't know what your wall is today, but I know that God's word can help us to overcome every barrier. And the very first key, and I'm gonna pull out a, a word in this verse that you might not have pulled out but I just feel like it's igniting on the inside of me this weekend. Joshua chapter six and verse two, the Lord said to Joshua, everybody say this word out loud with me, ready? See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its valiant warriors. You know, God told Joshua, it's a done deal. He says, I have given, notice it was past tense. 
He didn't say, I'm going to give it to you. He didn't say, I might give it to you. He says, I have given it to you. But it's the word before that that I want you to notice. He told Joshua, I want you to see it. I want you to picture it. Three things we need in our lives if we're gonna break through some of the barriers that hold us back. Number one, you need a prophetic picture in your life. You need a prophetic imagination so that God can give you a dream and a vision that can drive your life. Did you know that imagination is so powerful? You know, all the way back, we know the story of Noah and God deciding, no, we're gonna, we're gonna start over Well, the key verse there is it says the imaginations of men's hearts were on evil continually. Imagination is so powerful. And Proverbs tells us that where there is no vision, people perish. You see, God is a God of vision. God is a God of pictures. And God can give us a prophetic picture of a preferred future. What is vision for my life? What could be and what should be for the glory of God? What God has for us that we might not be living in yet, God tells Joshua, I want you to see it first. I want you to see that Jericho is already yours. I want you to see that the walls are already down. There's power in a picture. Albert Einstein said this. He said, imagination is more important than knowledge. The science of cybernetics tells us there's two kinds of change. There's outward change, which can be a quick fix. Like say, hey, I wanna lose weight, okay, eat less and work out more, and that can help, but most of the time it's a quick fix. In fact, most of those resolutions are ending now or have already ended or will end in about two weeks. It's the second kind of change that's more powerful. It's called conceptual change. The first kind of change is behavioral change. I'll just change my behavior. But the real kind of change The long lasting change, according to the science of cybernetics, is conceptual, it's internal, it's a mental picture. You see, I believe everything is created twice. It's created first on the inside, it's a mental picture, and then it comes to the physical, to the external. Think about it, everything in this room was created twice. It was an idea in somebody's mind. Your iPhone was an idea, it was a picture, it was was on the inside of someone, who invented it, and then it became a reality. And so external habits, those are good. Practice your skills, practice your scales, but the biggest return, the highest leverage, the biggest return on your investment is to work on your internal monologue, is to begin to ask God to give you a vision, a prophetic imagination for your life. That science study tells us that Uh, We all have about 60,000 thoughts a day. According to the Cleveland research on that, 80% of our thoughts are negative. How do we change that? We kind of just naturally, it's not hard. It's like, I just think the negative thing, right? It's so easy. How do we change it? You change it with the promise of God. How did those walls come down? First off, he said, I want you to see I have already given them to you. God begins with a promise in his word and his promise gives us a new picture on the inside. In fact, all the way back in Joshua chapter one, when God tells him, hey, Moses is gone. Now's your time. You will lead the people into the promised land. Look what he does. Joshua chapter one, he says, I'm gonna give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. What was Joshua's whole picture, his whole life, his overcoming based on? It was based on a promise from God. And he goes, he doesn't just stop and say, you got a promise. He gives him a picture. God doesn't just say, here's the promise. He goes, let me give you the picture. Your territory is going to extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates and the Hittite country oh, to the Mediterranean sea in the West. What is God doing? He's painting a picture for Joshua. Why is he doing that? Think about it. The last 40 years, all they've known is the wilderness. What do they see? They wake up in the morning. Here's the desert. Go to bed at night. Wake up in the next day is the desert, the wilderness. You couldn't plant crops. You couldn't grow your food. God had to supply them supernaturally. Hey, here's man is just gonna show up. Water's gonna come out of a rock. They saw the same thing day in, day out. But they had this promise of a promised land. But now God says, Joshua, here's the picture. Here's the map. Here's what it's going to look like. He's painting a picture because a picture is powerful. 
1980, the Russians uh, did an experiment with their athletes leading up to the Olympics. They separated their athletes into four groups, group A, B, C, and D. And they said, we're gonna change the way we train a little bit. Group A, you're gonna do traditional physical training. 100% of your training is gonna be physical training. Group two, we're gonna do 75% physical training, 25% mental internal training. Group C, 50-50. Group D, you're actually, these are world-class athletes. You're gonna do 25% physical training and you're gonna do 75% internal mental training. So came the time with the, the Moscow Olympics and the Lake Placid Olympics. And when the Olympics was done, they counted up the medals and the group that won the most medals out of all four groups was Group D, the group that had put more investment into their mental training. That's why God said to Joshua in Joshua chapter six, verse two, he said, see, I want you to see it, Joshua. I want you to picture it. This is yours. I promised it to you. See it. I have given it to you. Let me ask you a question today. What do you see? What do you see in the next coming months? What do you see in the next coming years? What do you see in your life? Sometimes I feel like, you know, when we've been down so long, it's hard to see something new, right? I mean, sometimes you feel like I've been hurt for so long, I have a hard time seeing myself whole. I have a hard time seeing myself healed. Somebody here today might say, I've been broke so long, I have a hard time seeing myself blessed. Someone might say, I've been stuck in the same spot so long, I have a hard time seeing success in this area of my life. Maybe you're here today and you wanna get closer to God, but you're like, man, I'm so filled with regret. I've been, so, I got this picture, I'm so caught up in my regret that I can't even see, I can't experience the revival God wants me to have in my life. Hey, listen, can I tell you what you need? You need a new picture in your life, right? You need a promise that will give you a new picture because God wants you to see what he has for you. You need a new picture. Say, Pastor, how are we gonna do that? Well, there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians, it's pretty cool. I'm not, I'm not having your screen, I'm gonna read it to you. 2 Corinthians 10, five says, for that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Many of those strongholds are the imaginations and the thoughts and the negativity and the stuff we get stuck in our minds. Now listen to this, you ready? Next verse. Casting down imaginations. Wow. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, taking every thought captive. In other words, it's gonna take some intentionality on our part. We're gonna to have to take the word of God and we're gonna to have to take the truth of the word of God and combat the lies of the enemy. We can tear down the strongholds, but it's gonna be like casting down imaginations, that imagination of failure, that imagination of rejection, that imagination of fear, that imagination of insecurity. You can take the word of God, the promise of who you are in Christ. Listen, that you're a new creation in Christ, that you're a child of God, that you have a destiny, that you have a purpose, that you're called, that you're gifted that God's anointing is on your life. You've got the gift of the Holy Spirit and God promises you, I have a plan and a future. And guess what? It's filled with hope and it's filled with God's favor. If you believe it today, come on, somebody give God praise, amen. That's the picture God has for you. He's got more. What do you see? How do we cast down those imaginations? With the promise of the word of God. Hey, you know what? What if this, what if by faith, you begin to spend some time in the word. What if by faith you begin to see yourself free from that addiction? You see yourself walking around, it's like, man, thank God, Lord, I used to be this, now I'm not anymore. What if you begin to see yourself healed emotionally? What if you begin to see yourself having joy again like you haven't had in a long time? What if you begin to see yourself ministering to somebody else, telling your story like, you know what God's done in my life? What if you saw yourself maybe starting a small group and going, you know, let me pour into some other people? What if we got a new picture and you begin to see yourself thriving, you see your relationships? I wanna tell you God's power can move on the picture that God gives you for your life. We need a prophetic imagination. There's a book that came out in the psychology world to help people get through trauma called The Body Keeps the Score. 
Bessel van der Kolk is the author. I hope I said that right. Listen to what he said. He believes that imagining a better reality while you're struggling with how you feel helps you to break out of your inner blocks. Victims of trauma often have a difficulty imagining future events due to being stuck in the present moment where things hurt so much. However, he said, as long as you can find a glint of hope in your mind about the future, now check this out, you ready? And can draw a better picture of it, you are more likely to overcome yourself and your traumatic events. Wow, that's powerful. I heard of a doctor named uh, Vera Freiling, and as a teenager, she was a Jewish teenager. She was on the run of the Gestapo during the Holocaust. She was kind of living underground and trying to hide, and she said while she was hiding from the Gestapo, she imagined her life in the future. It's what gave her hope. She imagined that she was a doctor, a psychiatrist. She imagined herself being a free land. She imagined herself overcoming, and she overcame the Nazis and the Soviet army and a bout with cancer. Amazingly, she ended up on the faculty of the San Francisco Medical School. Imagination, she says, can help someone transcend the insults that life gives us. I want to tell you, that's not a psychology thing. That's a God thing. God said, hey, listen, you can cast down wrong imaginations. And he told Joshua, I want you to see those walls already down. I want you to see yourself. Uh, you're already, you, this thing is done, is conquered. The promise of God gives you a prophetic picture of your future. Number two, second thing we need to break down the strongholds in our life, we need a patient persistence in our life. Yep, that's right. We can't just do it in prayer. We can't just do it in the picture, but we got to get right down to it. In other words, the next step is God gives them something that they have to walk out. You know the story, right? They had to walk around those walls they had to take steps every day for six days. I had to walk around it once a day for six days. On the seventh day, they had to walk around it seven times. And after that, they had to give a big shout of praise. There's something powerful about persistence. There's something powerful about walking something out. In a book by Ernest Hemingway, their uh, characters interviewing a businessman in the book, and they ask him this question. They said, hey, tell us, how did you go bankrupt? And the businessman says, oh, two ways. First, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> and that how a lot of things happen in life, right? Well, I did it. It was gradual, and then it was sudden. I love what the Russian comedian Yakov Smirnov, he says, when he came to America, he says, man, let me tell you what I love about America. He goes, when I first got here, I loved the grocery stores. He says, because I'd walk down the aisle of the grocery store, and I'd see a box that said, powdered milk. Add water, and you get milk. Wow, cool. I walked down a little bit further. There was a box that said, powdered orange juice. Add water, get orange juice. He says, I went down a little bit further and I saw a box that said, baby powder. And I thought, what a great country this is. <laughs> Back in the day when Walmart was blowing up and everybody's like, Walmart's amazing. Sam Walton, man, how did this happen? You know, and so... Sam Walton, one of his interviews, they asked him, how did you become an overnight success? He says, oh, he goes, it took me 20 years to be an overnight success. You see, many times we admire the people that get the breakthrough or, or get whatever it is, but sometimes we don't wanna make the same sacrifices. We can't have it both ways. It's gonna take some blood, sweat, and tears, amen? We're gonna have to pick up our cross and follow Christ daily. We can't break the law of sowing and reaping. There's no shortcuts. There's no cheat code. Generally speaking, your life is perfectly designed for what you're putting into it. So when we start into a, a, a new thing, you're, you're, you're like, you got a goal, you got a picture, um, there's this thing in business world recently, it's called the dip, and we have to be aware of the dip, all right? And so right, right here is the dip, and it basically is like right here, man, I got my picture, I got my goal, I got my dream, and I start putting effort into that dream, and what happens, I'm like, good night, look at this, it's working, it's working. But inevitably, there'll be some times and some moments that are return rate will be less, or that it'll seem to go backwards for a little bit. And right here, he says, is where most people 
quit. Most people give up. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't quit in the dip, all right? Don't quit in the dip, all right? Don't call him a dip. Just say, don't quit in the dip, all right? Yeah, I heard somebody back there, right? So now, but here's the thing. If you keep putting effort in, he says, here's what happens. Then little by little, slowly, when you're day by day, he goes, you will start to see a slow incline back in to the return on your investment of time and energy. So many times we start with the picture, but we don't have the patient persistence to see it out. There's a book series called Chicken Soup for the Soul. Anybody ever heard that, Chicken Soup for the Soul? Author of the book, a guy named Jack Canfield, um, the first 10 publishers they went to for that book said, no way. He said, people don't want a book about 100 inspirational stories. Second 10 publishers said, no, we're not interested. They went to 100 publishers with this manuscript, and they all said, no way. At that point, their agent said, I'm done, guys. We tried. I mean, 100. Okay, they said, okay, well, you, you, you know, you're done, but we're not done. They went to 10 more publishers. No, 10 more publishers. No, 130 publishers. No. Finally, they found a publisher, a small publisher in Florida that said, we're going to take a risk on your manuscript and we're going to publish it for you. 500 million copies later, they're glad that they didn't give up in the dip. Those chicken soup books are everywhere. And I'm sure glad that I'm sure they're glad they did it. See, um, every pastor knows what every health club owner knows that in January, there's like that, man, let's get it going. I gotta get healthy. And so, man, they have to buy extra machines for the gym and all that. But a lot of times they lease those machines because they lease them for about six weeks because it's gonna last about that long. Can I tell you the people that got healthier last year weren't the ones that started in January, the ones that finished in December. The people that got closer to God in 2023 wasn't the ones that just showed up in January. They're the ones that stayed through December. I'm gonna give you something I give almost every year. If you're here today and you're like, man, I'm getting my life right with God. I'm getting closer to God. I'm gonna get a better picture. Then I wanna give you what's called the one year challenge. And that is, I want you to give it a year. Come to church every time the doors are open. If you miss, just say, man, I'm getting right back the next week. Get in a group, get on a team. Go through our growth track. If you go to Fresh Start, get in everything we do. Give it a full year. And if at the end of that year, you are not closer to God and stronger, I will personally walk you to one of my friend's churches, okay? And so, but I've never had that happen. Because when someone says, I'm going to go all in, and they decide to walk it out. See, God told them, you got to walk around this thing. You got to start taking the steps that are necessary to get it done. So let's look at verse 12, Joshua chapter six, verse 12. Joshua got up early in the morning. This is after God told him what to do. He responded quickly. He was fast at obeying God. And the priests carried the ark of the Lord, the seven priests with the ram's horns. They marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. And the armed men marched in front of the priests with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. Listen, the ark of the covenant represents the presence of God. And this is a whole nother message, but I just got to drop a seed of it. They had armed men protecting the presence of God. Today, the presence of God is in us. It's in you, in me. We're the temples of God's spirit. Can I tell you that it's very cool and very necessary for us to protect the presence of God in our life? Because the enemy will try to bring contamination in through unforgiveness, through bitterness, through getting into fights. Ephesians chapter 4 says we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of us when we allow bitterness and malice and slander to reign and rule. Protect the presence of God in your life. Okay, that's a little seed for another message at another time, right? So here's what happened. Let's read the last part of that. On the second day, they got up again. He marched around the town once. They returned to the camp. Look at the last line. They followed this pattern for six days. God gave them a picture, and then he gave them a pattern. I love what John Maxwell says. The secret of your success is hidden in your daily routine. Do you have any patterns that you need to start in 2024? Sometimes it's as simple as downloading a Bible plan. Get a pattern of being in church on Sundays or Saturday night, get in a pattern of being in your, get in a pattern of the, the life of God, the church being the center of the life of God in your life. Get in a pattern, whatever it is, if it's your workout schedule, if it's five minutes of this, if it's one scripture a day, 
right? I'd rather you read one scripture a day than be inspired by my message and go home and read for three hours and then never read again all year long. Because you know why? Because consistency beats intensity every single time. You got any patterns you need to start? Got any patterns you need to stop? Okay, I got one more and I got to wrap it up here. Okay, number one, get a prophetic picture. Number two, be patient and persist in that goal and that dream and break down that wall. Number three, you need powerful praise in your life. Didn't you love our worship team today? Can we give it up for the worship team? Man, they just brought, they just brought it. It was so powerful. I was amazed at how many of the songs and the lyrics were like, you know, sometimes we play this, but we didn't this week. I was amazed, I listened to the songs. And I'm like, that's the, I'm preaching that. That's so, that's amazing. How do we do this? That's, well, it's God, he knows, it's the Holy Spirit, right? God gave them this, uh, this thing where they're just really going around Jericho. And it's, it's the sound of praise. And so what I want to say this is this. Ultimately, Jericho was overthrown by a sound. By a sound. Not an ordinary sound. A supernatural sound of praise. You don't understand how powerful your praise is. You really don't. I don't think you understand that when you come and when you sing and when you worship, I don't think you know what's really going on behind the scenes, but you're going to find out here in just a minute. And because God tells them to do something that's kind of different. Like he says, I want you to praise before the walls come down. A lot of times we're just like, when God does something in our life, we're like, thank you, God. And that's great. We should do that. Because I believe this, whatever you don't turn to praise turns to pride. Saying when God does something great, you, you worship him, you honor him, you make him first. But look at this. God says, praise them before. So the priests were blowing these horns. There were seven ram's horns. And during the first six days, they're walking around. They're just blowing these things. Got the ram's, the people of Jericho is probably like, what is what's going on out there with these people? Seven priests. Here's what the horns were about. The people of God have something called the year of Jubilee. And it was announced by ram's horns and a shout. The year of Jubilee happened like every 50 years. And when the year of Jubilee came, all the debts were canceled. Wouldn't that be great? And then if there were slaves, slaves were set free during the year of Jubilee. Significantly, it was announced by the blowing of these horns. Here's what was happening. When those horns were being blown, they were outside declaring the message of Jubilee over Jericho. They were declaring, they were proclaiming the kingdom of God. They were declaring the year of Jubilee. This is the prophetic sound that was being released by those ram's horns. Guess what? It was filling the airwaves. It was filling the atmosphere. It was awakening the hope on the inside of them. That sound, it was a declaration that the kingdom of God has come. And then at the last blow, God told Joshua, tell the people, shout as loud as they can. And he says, shout for God has given you the city. It's a powerful weapon. Your worship is so powerful. Your worship changes the atmosphere, breaks down walls. It's an act of your faith. I'm gonna read you one last scripture today as our worship team comes. Joshua chapter six and verse number 15 it says, on the seventh day, they got up at daybreak. They marched around the city seven times, except on that day, they circled the city seven times. And the seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded them and he said, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Can you imagine the scene of like 8,000 warriors? Can you imagine the sound, the sheer volume? You know what they were doing when they shouted? They were saying they're amen to God's promise. 1 Corinthians 1 20, that's for us today in the New Testament. It says that all the promises of God in Christ, what are they? Come on, somebody tell me. They are what? Yes and amen. When you sing your praise to God, you're saying amen to God's yes. Bow your heads. I want to pray for you today.